Hello and welcome to another video from Murder in the UK. Today we are investigating Robert Maudsley. In 1973, Maudsley was a rent boy. He was picked up by a paedophile who showed Maudsley pictures of children that he had abused. Maudsley was horrified and killed the man. He was declared medically unfit and sent to Broadmoor. Over the years, while locked up, he has gone on to kill three more people, each time a paedophile, on one occasion going up to see the prison governor and saying, at roll call tonight, there will be two people missing. Maudsley is widely reported as being a cannibal. His first victim in prison, he allegedly ate part of his brain. This has been denied by a previous prison guard who was reported to murder in the UK that this was complete fabrication. Maudsley allegedly stabbed the man in the side of the head through the ear and obviously this contained blood. But the rumours went round the prison that he ate a part of the brain after he had licked the knife clean and the legend carried on. Maudsley's on the Home Office list of prisoners who should never be released. Please see more on the website www.murderuk.com or carry on watching this video where shortly follows a documentary about the case. Thank you. In the 1970s, Robert Maudsley took the lives of four men, three of them while he was remanded in prison. I call him Britain's Hannibal Lecter or Cannibal Maudsley. First and foremost, he's my uncle, my dad's brother, younger brother, and he was sentenced to life for murder. And after being sentenced to life for murder, he was sent to Broadmoor, where he was able to kill again. Robert Maudsley murdered four men. Each of these men were known to be sexual abusers. As far as he was concerned, these murders were justice killings. This is something that we do see played out on occasion. It's a belief that they are more a hero than a villain. Murderer Robert Maudsley now has the reputation of being Britain's most dangerous prisoner and has been in solitary confinement since 1979. You love your family through thick and thin, as they say, you know. It doesn't matter what they've done, this is what you're saying when it's family. Murder is revenge. Murder is getting his own back from a brutal childhood. There's no sugar coating now. There's not. He's a serial killer, yeah. But he's, he's the only person to go into prison as a murderer, and he became a serial killer in jail. Serial killer Robert Maudsley is one of Britain's most notorious prisoners and is one of only 66 people serving a whole life tariff. He committed his first uh, crime when he was uh, 20 years old, uh, that was a murder, um, and, and it was for that murder that he was put in jail, put in Broadmoor Hospital to be completely accurate. However, it was whilst in Broadmoor that he started this, this series of killings uh, which have made him uh, Britain's most dangerous uh, prisoner. Growing up in Liverpool in the 60s, Robert Maudsley was one of 12 children. From a very early age, he and his three elder siblings were brought up in a children's home. Gavin Maudsley is his nephew. Robert would have been six months old. My dad would have been about two, two and a half. I think neighbours had called the social services to talk about, you know, the kids were being neglected. It was about eight or nine years later. And the story I was told was somebody wanted to adopt my dad. And for that to go through, they would have to inform the, the biological parents to see if this adoption could go through. At this point, my dad thinks he's an orphan. And my grandparents put a block on that and said, oh, no, we don't want them to be adopted. We'll have them back. And they didn't know them. Robert didn't really know that he had parents. He had no recollection of them. He had no memories of what they looked like. So they considered themselves orphans. It must have been a real shock to suddenly find themselves being put back with the very abusive parents they'd once been taken from. And they were strangers, so they went home to strangers. And it was then that's when they were beaten 
told to go out and steal. If they got caught stealing, they would get a beating for getting caught, not for doing the stealing. Gavin was told by his father, Paul, that he, Robert, his sister, and their two brothers were crammed into their parents' house. Over the years, they were joined by eight more brothers and sisters. It was abuse, pain, sleeping on floors in a bedroom, sleeping on a mattress, being covered up by a coat, not even having bed clothes, being locked in the room for weeks at a time if they did anything wrong. Their father was a violent man. Me dad said, for some reason, it's as if the worst was reserved for Robbie. Like the granddad just didn't like Robbie for some reason, you know? And although they all had a bad time and a rough time, it's like Robbie got the worst. I believe there was one time he came into the room with an air rifle cocked and he broke, broke the air rifle across Robert's back, hit him across the back with it and broke the air rifle. It's not unusual that the youngest child in the family or the weakest child in the family is the one who's attacked mostly. Firstly, they need more care. That's frustrating. Abusers don't like to have to care. And secondly, they are, just by their very nature, more vulnerable and fragile. So that essentially means that they're easier to control. Why? Who does that to a young boy? I ain't got them answers. But it's just abuse. That's all it is, it's just abuse. Any child who's given away is thinking, I'm not good enough. I was given away. And then you're taken back and then you're beaten up, you're abused. To the point where you're losing your mind. And he knew bad things were gonna happen and he ran away. Robert and his elder brothers eventually fled the violence of their parents. Robert was 18. He was beaten up for many years. Robert ran away to London, my uncle Kevin ran away to somewhere, and my dad ran away and met my mum. And then the three brothers lost touch for many, many years then. London seemed to be a place where they would head to, as I guess it was the kind of bright lights, the promise of a new start and opportunity. But what they found and what Robert found was a place of incredible hardship and a place that was bedeviled with vice and these awful pitfalls. Being just 18 at the time, Robert was working as a rent boy and mixing with a criminal underclass. Morsley was raped in London and this was carried out by an someone he, he, that was an associate of his. He's run away to London, met some guy. The guy showed him pictures, supposedly, of a girl that he was abusing. And my uncle freaked out, killed him went to the police station, handed himself in. There was no manhunt. And he said, I've just killed a sex offender. Here I am, now will you help me? John Farrell uh, was a builder and that he uh, met Maudsley um, to have sex. He murdered John Farrell in cold blood. Prepared to admit to murder, Robert believed he would now get the help he desperately wanted. What separates Robert Maudsley from many killers is after he carries out his first murder, he hands himself in. Robert Maudsley is not a fool. He knows that killing that person will result in a criminal sentence. And he willingly does it. He walks in firstly because he knows that he's a danger to people. And secondly, because he recognizes that there will be consequences. He has great insight. And that's quite unusual for people like him. Robert was on his own, his family scattered around the country, getting on with their own lives, with their own families. But he was not forgotten. My dad didn't know where Robert was, and it was only reading the papers that he learned that Robert had killed someone. I knew he was in prison and he'd done wrong, but it was never explained to me when I was a child what he had done, for obvious reasons. And it was when I was around maybe 12, 13 years of age. I was in senior school. Um, one of my friends in class was reading maybe the Daily Mirror or something like that, and there was a double spread, Cannibal Maudsley, or Britain's Hannibal Lecter, with the story, and there was a photograph of him. And I do look like my uncle in this photograph. And one of my friends said, hey, is, who's this Maudsley fella? Is he related to you? And I knew straight away then that that was my uncle Bob. 
So I was able to read that newspaper article and really get to grips with what he had done and learn the details of it. And it was only then that I've gone back and spoke to my mum that I've seen this in the paper about Uncle Bob, blah, blah, blah. And that's when I was to find out exactly what had happened. Over the next three years, he was locked up for the murder in London. Maudsley's behaviour in prison made him infamous. The fact that Robert Maudsley was called Cannibal Maudsley and Britain's Hannibal Lecter just demonstrates how the press love to put a bit of a Hollywood spin on murder. The reality is that he never, ever ate any of his victims. Yes, he killed them in a really grisly way, but he didn't at any point cannibalise his victims. It's really important to say that because by calling him a cannibal, you dehumanise him further. And by doing that, you forget to see his reasoning and his instinct behind the killings. There's no reality to justice what he did, it's wrong. But you forget the reality of his story. And there is a story with Robert Morsley, and it's one that we all need to listen to. He's my special uncle. Because I've got no other uncle that I could compare to him in any kind of way, you know? You know, all, all my other uncles are just, just my uncles, you know? Whereas Uncle Bob, he's done these crazy things and stuff like that, and there's this big story surrounding him, and that in itself puts a bit of a cloud over the family. But I'm trying to move that cloud because for too many years it's been like that, and, you know, you've been through all that pain, so let's just enjoy what we've got together. Universally, homicide comes from training. He has been trained, as, as all other murderers have, to be violent, to be brutal, to be um, it's, it's, uh, killing. And, and, and that's what's happened to him in his childhood. His father has gone in there and beaten him, right? How does he know he's going to stop? He doesn't know he is going to stop. If he doesn't stop, he's dead. He knows that. This man, and, his, and, his, and his, the woman that was meant to be his mother, were there to prevent him dying. And here they are inflicting this on his, on his life. His life hangs by a thread by these lunatics. So this is all volcanic, it's all inside him. Uncle Bob has got that genius inside him, but to just put a toe over the other side of the line, he's got that monster inside him. In 1974, Robert Maudsley was held on remand for confessing to the killing of John Farrell. He was found unfit to stand trial and was sentenced to life imprisonment in a high-security psychiatric hospital. So my dad had read the newspaper and just come across this murder and it said Robert Maudsley and it said in London and my dad was just convinced that it was his brother. He was saying there can't be that many Robert Maudsleys. He's admitted to Broadmoor, which is supposedly a hospital. It's not. Hospitals are where you go to heal, to get health, to get a cure. He has this bottled volcano of anger, which is exacerbated. He didn't kill any innocent people. You know, he didn't go and stalk anyone. You know, there wasn't some innocent woman or guy who left home in the morning and didn't return at night. There was nothing like that. My uncle's done terrible things, I'm not trying to say he hasn't. But I say he's guilty of taking the Lord into his own hands. So for me, I can bring some justification to what he did. It really doesn't surprise me that Gavin and his family don't feel any shame about Robert Morsley. As far as they're concerned, he exterminated some kind of infection, which as far as they are concerned, paedophiles are part of. So this justice killing is something that we do see played out on occasion. It's a belief that they are more a hero than a villain. And because you can kind of stand there and say, I understand the motives, I understand the reasoning behind his actions, Therefore, I can still love him. Robert had admitted to his first murder, believing it would get him the help he thought he needed in prison. When he didn't, he killed again. It was in Broadmoor Hospital that Robert Morsley committed his second murder. He and another, another prisoner uh, at Broadmoor Hospital took this man, David Francis, uh, hostage. They, they brought him into a cell uh, shut the door and, and and then proceeded to torture him for nine hours and during that time they committed 
unspeakable acts against this man. My Uncle Bob took him prisoner. He locked him in a room. I think he had him in a room for several hours. He smashed his head against the wall in and all this. It lasted several hours, that. Maudsley tore this man apart. He, he smashed open his head. And it's a fact that a spoon was found in, in the victim's brain. Uh, so Maudsley said he did not use that spoon to eat his brain, but the spoon was lodged there. And what's really um, surprising is this was allowed to happen for, for nine hours. For nine hours, they could not get access to the cell or, or they were not aware this was going on and so allowed it to continue. And it's hard to imagine how you can uh, sustain a torture for nine hours, but, but that's what Morsley did. He desecrated the man's body because that's how he felt his body had been desecrated. He took every minute, moment, feeling fear savagely out on his victim. He created pictures in his mind about what this man deserved that would probably have been wholly undeserved, really. Morsley tried to justify this by saying that the man was a paedophile and therefore deserved what he got. And it's very clear that at that time, all the scars that Morsley was carrying came bursting open. All this trauma he suffered over his life became focused on that second victim. Robert had taken the lives of John Farrell and now David Francis. His actions forced authorities to move him. He was taken to Wakefield Prison, nicknamed Monster Mansions. They pleaded guilty, and from there they sent him to Wakefield. And they've put him on an open wing with rapists and murderers and paedophiles and sex offenders. And he's like, what the hell's going on here? Put me in solitary confinement, I need to be on my own. The problem is with somebody like Robert Morsley, he's an intelligent guy. He's gone through all the right avenues to try to get the help that he required and deserved and needed and was due, but everyone ignored him. So how can you get heard unless you really do crank up the volume? Murdering somebody and turning yourself in, hey guys, here I am, now what are you gonna do? In a prison setting, the sex offender is a, a classic victim. So when he's looking to take revenge or whatever it is, then he's looking for somebody who's already got a black mark against them in the prison culture. In 1978, Robert found his next victims, two prisoners he believed to be paedophiles. He spent a long time trying to lure people into his cell and quite a few prisoners reported afterwards that they were almost enticed into that cell but decided not to go, which was lucky for them because if, if they had entered that cell, they would have been killed. Uh, but there were two men um, who made that fateful, fateful decision and they, and they paid for it with their lives. The story is he was gonna try and kill seven, eight, nine, ten. I don't know what number, could be the definite number, but he's, he managed to kill two in the same morning. And the story is he walked into the, the guard's office, threw a knife on the desk that was still covered in blood and all this, and said, you're gonna to be too short sure for roll call tonight. I think he snapped the head off a spoon. So he had like a stabbing implement. I think he stabbed, it pierced his brain. It, right, there, right down his ear, pierced his brain. He swung him round by his legs and smashed his head off the wall and all this in the cell. And he, he took that body underneath the bed and then he went looking for the next victim. So he was, he was walking around to kill as many sex offenders as he could get his hands on. As far as I know, I believe one of the guys he killed wasn't a sex offender, or he wasn't a paedophile at least. I think he was in there for raping and killing his wife. So still a bad guy by any way you want to measure it, you know? Still not an innocent guy in my eyes. So he killed two people in one sitting that morning. Undoubtedly, Robert Morsley feels justified in what he did. He sees paedophiles as vermin and he feels that it's appropriate to extinguish them. And whether we like to acknowledge it or not, that is not an uncommon belief system in the UK there will be many who feel that he was justified in his actions. But we have to always be aware that taking somebody's life is the most grave thing that anyone can do. It is the worst behavior of a human being. 
I think the whole thing is arbitrary. The, the, the victims are people who have to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, but that's universal for all murderers, in my view. Um, all murderers kill some sort of parental figment. Now, why he chose paedophiles in a prison context is because paedophiles are universally victimized in a prison term. The fact that they were paedophiles, the fact that they weren't paedophiles, it doesn't matter. That's not significant. Authorities took drastic steps to prevent Maudsley killing again. The decision would become the stuff of Hollywood legend. It was from that moment he's been in solitary confinement permanent. The papers built the glass pierce cell in 1983 for him in the belly of Wakefield prison. It's said that Thomas Harris, Science of the Lambs, got the idea for that cell from Robert Story. Because that happened in 1983 and Science of the Lambs was 1991. It was when Gavin was 12 that he discovered the truth about his Uncle Robert in prison. You know, it's not every, every day you learn that you've got a, a serial killer uncle who's killed four people, you know? How often do you hear that one? Still, when people find out to this day for the first time, you know, I tell them the story, it's, it's just shock. And that's what I felt, yeah, I was shocked and... Felt, felt the sorrow, you know? Felt, you know, it's a real bad situation for the family to be in and to have that cloud over the family and everyone's probably dealing with it in their own way, internally, you know? For Gavin, where suddenly he uncovers that his uncle is the wolf of Wakefield and he's murdered people. I mean, it's ultimately shocking. But the thing about being family is that you want to protect your kids. Clearly, Gavin's parents are good parents who protect him. How do you start that dialogue? How do you say, hey, you know your uncle? Well, actually, he's somebody who's murdered four men. It's a difficult one for a child to process. And even though honesty is always the best policy, many people struggle to explain when people in their family have done things like this. Robert's brother Paul had not seen him since they escaped their violent family as teenagers. When he discovered Robert was in prison, he began to rebuild their family relationship. I first met him when I was 18 months old. I was taken into the prison for a visit and my mum told me that. It was unlike any other visit for anybody else going on a visit in the prison. Bob was segregated in the basements of the prison, so they were taken through the prison, they go into the belly. And apparently we've gone into a room and there was a table in the middle and six guards on the back wall. And then me and my mum and dad have come in and then six guards have brought Bob in and they've stood on the other side of the wall. So there was six guards here, six guards there. And that really terrified me, Mum. Not the fact that she was meeting Bob, it was just a scary situation with all these guards and that, you know? He's a double cat, eh? Which is the most serious. And he's, you know, solitary confinement indefinitely for life. And you gotta remember, that's not for his safety. That's for the safety of all sex offenders in the prison. Because he could kill a person a day, there's no more prison he can give him. So he's in segregation for the other prisoner's safety, not for his safety. Robert had known for a long time that he needed help from the authorities. He would often say that when these crimes happened, he would see his father's face. He would see my granddad's face. He said that maybe if he'd have killed his parents, none of these people would have died. The fact is that what's particularly striking about this was at his, at his murder trial in 1979, he said, I th when I'm killing people, I think of my parents. The crime across the board is revenge for what happened a long time ago. So he's killing his parents. They aren't his parents, but the distortion of perception has gone, and these people are standing in lieu of his parents. So then he gets a situation where people are smaller, uh, he's in charge, and he can kill them. And for some reason, uh, irrational reason, no sensible reason, these people appear in, in the role of parents. So he kills them because he wants to kill his parents. The violence Robert and his siblings suffered at the hands of their father tore them apart, but it also united them. His relationship with his brothers now are crucial, as they were up to the age of six. 
they give him support, unconditional support, which is wonderful. His brothers knew him from before. They, they respected his intelligence, they respected his determination, and they give him support now. Maudsley had now killed four men. John Farrell, David Francis, Salney Darwood, and Bill Roberts. I feel for the families, for their loss. You know, that was someone's father, that was someone's brother, someone's son. But still I have to flip the coin over and say to myself, but yeah, they were bad people also. Because I have to justify it in that way. Robert was considered so dangerous, he was locked up in a custom-made cell in Wakefield Prison. Morsley's cell is 18 foot by 14.5 feet. It's made of glass. Uh, it's very similar to the cell we've seen in the movie depicting the life of Hannibal Lecter. So he's kept in eerily similar conditions uh, with just the most basic um, of necessities inside that cell. Um, and he sits there every day, uh, much like Hannibal in the film. He has these haunting eyes, which are very intense, uh, this pale skin, uh, this thick shock of dark hair. He looks, to all intents and purposes, like your typical Hollywood horror film character. And his cell is very unusual um, in the prison system. His cell has, um, has been designed for him. It's uh, been created um, to, to handle what um, has been an ongoing problem for Wakefield Prison, and it's, and it's been created to allow him to continue living in a way where the warders feel assured that their, their safety is, is maintained and they're, and they're not gonna be his fifth victim. Robert's family do not share the concerns of the prison guards. They visit at every opportunity. We don't go anywhere near the other visiting area when we go into Wakefield. We actually go through all the prison corridors, we go out by the exercise yards, and then we go downstairs into another part of the prison. And quite often Charlie Bronson could shout down to me. Charlie Bronson's there also on that wing. We go in and Bob's put in one cell and there's a, an adjoining cell with a little sofa in and we sit there. And he'll keep a guard outside the door normally and we can have the door closed. He met me when I was 18 months old. I'm named after him. So I'm kind of, if anyone's got a right to see him, it best be me, you name me after him. I'm named after a serial killer. At least me go and see him, you know? <laughs> so I'll make a laugh and a joke about something like that. We don't want it to be too serious because all the pain and the anguish, that was years ago. They've got through that now. Now they're still, you know, they're still living this painful existence kind of thing. But all that's behind them kind of thing. He's been in jail for 45 years. I'm 42. He's been in jail longer than I've been alive. And when you look at it like that, it's hard to comprehend, you know? Gavin and his uncle have a strong bond, keeping in touch with each other regularly. He likes to write his letters, tell me what he's been watching on TV, tell me to catch up on something to watch that he's seen advertised, or ask me if I've seen this movie that he's just watched. I'll tell him to catch up with some Formula One, stuff like that. But he really loves the wildlife programmes as well, the Attenborough ones, things like that. Robert Morsley's letters are, are interesting. They show some insights into his, into his character, his personality. He talks a lot in his letters about art, about... Um, poetry, about the finer things in life, uh, which stand in stark contrast um, to his very kind of basic and brutal existence. He signs himself off Wolfie because he took on a bit of a nickname, um, the Wolfman of Wakefield. He refused to shave, he refused a haircut, so he ended up having real long hair and a beard down his chest somewhere here, and that's where he picked up the name Wolfie. He's no longer got that long hair or beard, but the name is stuck. I still, I still address him as Wolfie. Now, part of me thinks that that's about feeling empowered. I'll take something that was negatively thrown at me and I'll own it. And we see that a great deal with particular words. But the other side of it is potentially that it gave him a certain standing. The wolf of Wakefield. A wolf is dominant, powerful, dangerous. And even though he's using it in friendly terms, it suggests a particular type of belief in his personality. During a stay at Parkhurst Prison on the Isle of Wight, Robert finally got the help he had long craved, 
when he met Dr. Bob Johnson, a prison psychiatrist. I visited the prison in May 1991, and I was taken round the hospital wing. And as we're going round, this is this, this is that. Then they opened the, the main cell door, and then there's a wire mesh door inside that. And there's this gaunt figure, long, blood, drag hair, miserable as sin, sunken face. So I made a mental note. I thought, that's somebody I'm going to have to work hard to get alongside. And it took me two or three years to get permission from the senior medical officer to go into the hospital and start sessions with Robert Maudsley. I overcame his suspicion of people in authority um, and he agreed to be to see me and initially uh, it was quite tricky because I saw him in his cell and he was sitting on his bed near the window and I sat near the door and I said if you frighten me I'm going so we started talking about his past and got a bit too close he said my palms are getting sweaty I said I'm out of the door just let me know and we had this understanding. And by that time, he had enough interest in me possibly helping him. We got an understanding, that's the key. We got an understanding and we were working well. What you're wanting to do, you're wanting to get into the room and feel the emotions of the child. But we realised there's certain uh, hazards to actually doing that. But how do we still get in there? How would you describe the progress, the progress that you're making? The, the, the progress of today, I think you've, you've come more into the room with me, mm -hmm. you, even though we're at a distance. Uh -huh. I'm able to talk about things, a lot more, a lot more things today yeah. than I was able to, say, six or more, nine months ago. Robert's sessions with Dr. Bob only lasted two years. We see the thing, Bob, and well, I say I know, I know, I know in the past when I've tried to sort of face these things. What's the thing? You know, I, 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 oh, I, 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 I'm just capable of doing anything, Bob, oh, as the adult here. Exactly. Exactly. And, that, and that's what I've got to be cautious about, you know. Absolutely right. You, you, you're keeping yeah. the speed on these things, right? All I'm doing is saying this is where we're going to move in due course. I think what I've been doing, I think I'm effectively putting in pieces. Right. But I have to make sure the pieces fit. Well, they right. will eventually. That's right. Yes, you yeah. do. You have to piece them together. Yeah. That's and right. I think that's come out fairly well. I do. I think you're doing brilliant. I mean, you know. From then on, he only had his family to rely on. Oh, I'll keep these letters forever, you know. This is like, this is proof to me that I, I really did have an Uncle Bob. Do you know what I mean? Not just the monster that people have read about in the papers and stuff. That's the words of Robert Morsley there, you know? And that tells me a different story. I t I'm, I'm reading of someone completely different that the tabloids have tried to tell me about. It's like night and day. So for me, that's... That will always be, always be something special to me, though, to know that it, this guy isn't the monster that the world perceives him to be. They, they humanise him. That's what they do for me. Many of Robert's letters refer to the children's home he and his brothers lived in before they returned to their parents. I'm trying to remember the times where Robert's wrote to me and he's reminiscing about good times he had at Nazareth House. I've got a letter here where he writes a little paragraph just about that. And that reads, You're right, Gavin. We do try to have a good time when the three musketeers are together. And that goes right back to 1950s when we were all together at Nazareth House in Crosby. And at least felt safe from physical harm. And to us, it felt like our home. And whilst there was no actual physical, tangible love, we were at least clothed, fed, and dressed to a degree, and able to act like children, and not be punished for it. So we enjoyed the time at Nazareth House. The fact that Kevin Paul and Robert Morsley called themselves the Three Musketeers is interesting because the Three Musketeers, all they did was good. They were the people who would always turn up at the right time, they were justice seekers. And I can't help but think that they used that terminology again to disassociate themselves from the horror and instead see themselves as people who understood why Robert carried out those crimes. Nazareth House was the last place 
for us where we were all happy together. That's how he signs off the letter. So this is the last place where the three brothers were happy together, yeah. And that's quite moving, you know, yeah. But it's also nice to come here and to visit the place where he did have some good times at least also, you know, so I'm glad I came. Three Musketeers, Nazareth House, there it is. The serial killer, that was just a fleeting instance of manic insanity, just just for a moment. That's not how he is. That that's that's not the guy you see living 24 hours a day. That's just a moment of insanity captured at that moment in time. Robert Maudsley brutally murdered four men. These crimes earned him a lifetime sentence in prison. But there was also an unlikely outcome for Robert's relationship with his family. The fact that they broke apart and got back together, that's just, it's just brought the strength back to that little trio, you know? They need to be in touch with each other, them three guys, because I think on their own, they're just back to where they was years ago. Now they're reunited, it's kind of like they're through that and they can see each other. And, you know, when we do go and visit, all the stories they're reminiscing about, it's all about stories when you were this big. Ultimately, we all want to believe the best in people that we love. It's just part of our foundation. It's what makes us have good relationships. If you have got somebody that you love in prison and you can create a narrative in your brain that makes sense, and you also know that they're clever and kind and caring, and when you spend time with them, they're lovely, well, suddenly I can't see your blackness. I can't see your darkness. I can't see the evil. All I can see is a wronged person trying to do the right thing, unfortunately, in the wrong way, and paying the price. It's good the way things are now. You know, the Three Musketeers, we call them. Me dad, Kevin, and me uncle Bob, they're called the Three Musketeers, and they've been reunited. So I called myself D'Artagnan. Yeah? Because <laughs> I've entered the fray. They have a good relationship, and... I say, you know, if, you were to, if you were to meet them, you would, you would not believe it's the same guy that you're reading about, you know? He's such a funny guy and he's so humorous. Robert Maudsley is Britain's longest serving prisoner incarcerated in solitary confinement. So there's some similarities in terms of the same prison bottom, in terms of being placed in strong box, strong box with cages. Mm -hmm. It's so much like a room, mm -hmm. so much like a cupboard. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and don't forget, there are times when you don't forget they, they strip me naked, just like my father used to strip naked. There's so many similarities in terms of shoving shove food and just falling on the floor. This is cruel and unusual punishment. We lock him up because he's he, the prison's most dangerous. He's not the prison's most dangerous individual. Of course, he can't be. He's talking. To, I sit in a cell with this man for what four hours or whatever it was overall. I'm sitting there and I'm talking to him. I'm talking about dangerous subjects. He's not the most dangerous man. Morsley has changed. He's become uh, a calmer, uh, more serene individual who's more at peace uh, with uh, his life and the world around him. But he is still considered uh, to be dangerous. When he leaves his cell, he's always accompanied by six prison officers. Um, and, and that reflects the ongoing concern um, about Morsley's state of mind and, and the threat that one day he might carry out another murder. For Gavin, however, his uncle Robert is no threat. He's his father's brother and still close family. They could, I could say in a sense the crimes I've brought them together, you know? But I think also that will like, it's definitely cemented a bond that can never be broken for the lives that they've led together and separated, you know? The, that bond will never be broken. They've been through too much together, you know? And there's such a strong unit, the three of them. None of them would let each other down ever. It wouldn't happen that way. I think for most families, if, if, if you had Robert Morsley in your family, uh, you might feel some um, shame about that. That would be, that would be normal, I think. Um, you might want to 
cover up the fact that uh, Robert Morsley is your uncle or your cousin or whoever he may be. Um, you, you might want to hide that aspect of your, um, your family story. Uh, but Robert actually has a, a very warm relationship with most of his relatives. He is a, a loving family member, just one that happens to be a serial killer and is about to set a record for the amount of time he's been held in solitary confinement. There's three people in the world allowed to visit him. That's my dad, my uncle Kevin, and me. Robert's officially Britain's most dangerous prisoner, documented from the Home Office, that's official. He's not a one-dimensional monster. He is um, and has been um, a very bad man, a very dangerous man. Um, but he does have these um, redeeming aspects to his story, which, which make you feel um, some sympathy for his plight. And that particularly, that really does throw into relief the fact that he's been subjected to this very brutal and very long uh, period um, of incarceration um, and, and had, to, had to live through something that really no, no person should have to live through, um, not having contact uh, with another human being uh, for, for four decades now. It's, it's quite astonishing. A man who's severely damaged in his childhood, who's done serious damage in his adult life, and he is rescuable, he is treatable, he is remediable. He could earn money if his uh, mind was engaged, his intellect was engaged, his, his persistence, his determination was engaged in, in gainful employment, and that's what I would want him to do. I would want him to say, now look, these people are no longer alive because of what you did. Compensate them, earn money, pay the families, do something to uh, rectify the situation, and explain to me and the general population why you will never kill again. Robert Morsley is an unusual case to me. I look at him and I think, no, probably. He could have been somebody who, if he'd been given the right nurture, would never have become a killer. Probably would have become something amazing for humanity, potentially. But because of the torture, because of the abuse, because of the sexual dysfunction, because of the horrible shame that he would have carried, it manifested within his DNA. It basically meant that what would once have been completely latent and not activated became activated and dangerous. And it's a shame for society that he's in prison in that way. You love your family through thick and thin, as they say, you know? It doesn't matter what you've done, this is what you're saying when it's family. But when you've been through such a struggle with family members and you've been part of the same pain, and then that pain has affected them in different ways and it affected Bob the most in the biggest way, then I think they had to get back together and they had to be that unit again in order to get through, I think, you know? Robert Morsley, the man. Loyal to a T, to his family. That's how I'd sum him up. He's, he's family orientated to the ones he loves, you know? So to, to not get the love from the family members where you should be getting it, i.e. your parents, he found that love with his, his brothers, you know? And thank God he did. But what we have to accept is that part of my makeup in terms of uh, social function, relationships and so forth, effectively does stem back from the, yeah. the experience of childhood. Yeah. Terrifying, petrifying, frightening, scared. Right, right. Everything totally powerless. Yeah. We can turn around and say, okay, quite a lot of bad things have happened to us. You know, we've done quite a lot of things, you know, bad things, etc. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, we, we, we should have come clean with our consciousness and our spirit and our souls to the extent that we can turn around and say, okay, let's be reborn again. Thank you for watching. Murder UK is a website dedicated to giving the facts about murders and serial killers within the UK. Please consider subscribing and press that bell icon to be notified when we update new videos. Thank you.